So, um, so anyway, we'll give more information about that as we get closer. Um, so our speaker today is Monica Baskin, who is professor in the Division of Preventive Medicine. Um, she's trained in psychology. She, I think, had almost all of her education in Georgia at Emory and at Georgia State. Um, and she's been at UAB for quite a number of years now and um, is a real expert in engaging the community in research. And so the topic of her session today is community-based participatory research. And I apologize, I'm going to have to be going to that a couple of times here. Um, so thank you guys so much for um, uh, bearing with me this morning to, to learn a little bit more about what probably the bulk of my academic career is focused on, which is community-based participatory research. So I understand that you know you guys make up a very diverse audience, so from individuals that are fairly recently finished with one degree, working on others, all the way to faculty appointments. So, the idea here is to give you a, a general overview of what CDPR is um, and also to sort of hopefully get at least a few of you interested in perhaps looking at this as one of the kinds of approaches that you might um, use with your own research. So um, first and foremost, I just have a couple of disclosures. So part of what I'm going to do in <coughs> the presentation is talk to you about three um, National Cancer Institute funded projects that have been ongoing over the last 15 or plus years. So just disclosure, these are my comments and not necessarily representative of NCI or NIH. Um, so again, here are the, the four main things that I'm hoping to accomplish in our time today. So helping, hoping to get to the question of what is community-based participatory research, um, why is community engagement important, what does community engagement look like in action, sort of putting it in, into work, and then what are the challenges and opportunities in doing this kind of research. So one of the main things that I'll start with is most of you guys are probably familiar with the traditional research paradigm. And that um, generally has had a limited success. So you come in, most of typically or clinical um, trials, you have a recruitment person who goes out, has some advertising in newspapers or sends out some flyers and try to get folks in to their, um, their program. But overall what we found is that those programs tend to lack any tailoring. So it's a generic ad or it's a generic recruitment. Um, the programs may be one size fits all and that um, has led to some of the limited success that we have in these larger programs. Um, sometimes that means that it's not necessarily culturally relevant, so it may be, again, a one-size-fits-all, but there may be unique cultural aspects that are not really touched on by that intervention. Um, there hasn't been any community input, so you're out trying to do interventions at the larger population scale, but haven't really touched base with the population that you're trying to reach to figure out what they want or what they see as the individual or what the issues are. And then it usually focuses just on that individual behavior. You need to eat better, you need to move more, you need to you know, do this or that, and doesn't take into context the environment and the larger community in which people live. It also doesn't tend to give any recognition of the value of community members and other stakeholders and resources in all aspects of the research. So there's been a call for more effective models um, Research must be relevant and timely to meet the needs of decision makers. It also needs to include public mm -hmm. participation and transparency to really um, make sure that the public is confident. So when we're talking about these larger scale projects, either by the federal government or HHS, those kinds of folks, we need to know that the community needs to feel like, okay, these are programs that are for me, that are likely to be effective for me and my, my community, um, needs to have a scientific integrity. And so for those of you who might be familiar more with health outcomes, part of the, this whole PCORI movement is making sure that you do have the involvement of the constituency involved. So again, um, people have called for better and more effective models in getting community stakeholders involved. And so what are stakeholders and what is stakeholder engagement? So as, um, as the... Um, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality defines it, a stakeholder is basically a person or group who has a vested interest in a clinical, research, or health policy decision. 
So everybody in this room is a stakeholder for their own health, for the community health, um, and for other types of smaller populations. Um, there's stakeholder engagement, and that's a process of basically giving voice. So having people involved, um, communicating about what they want, and, and particularly in this case about effective health care related decision making and research. And it, it serves the purpose of reciprocal learning and knowledge exchange to improve health. So it's not just relevant to figure out what the academics feel or what the healthcare providers feel, but it is equally important to figure out what the patients and the constituents that you're trying to reach, what they feel and what they value as well. So again, thinking about where, where we're moving in terms of healthcare is in a very much an engaged model. So then why is it important to have those stakeholders involved? Um, it, one, builds trust between community members and other stakeholders, researchers, and providers. So for those of you who've had some experience with research before, um, are you familiar with people that you want to enroll in a trial and they are a little hesitant? Anyone have that experience? Okay. What, what do you think is the reason or have, they, have you engaged them in a conversation about why they may not be as, as interested in, in being enrolled? You don't understand. Okay. A lot of what are you trying to tell them? And there's always a concern. I mean, they're using it for experiments. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just uh, it's important to talk to them at a level that they understand why it's important for them. So yeah. From their perspective, that knowledge. Yes. Yeah, so absolutely. So part of it is um, how do you translate that formality and that consent form? Um, to an individual so that they really understand that. So I know a couple of you guys are going to actually, excuse yourself to go over to see some of the IRB reviews, but when we talk about informed consent, is it really informed if people don't understand the language that you're talking about? Um, I would say no. So a lot of what we talk about is using language and terms that people are not as familiar with. So that is part of it, just education. And then the other part that I heard you say is about trust. Are you experimenting on me? Is this just for the sake of you getting another publication? Mm -hmm. um, who's going to, I mean, is this really going to help me? Or some groups in particular have good reason to be suspicious because of things that have happened historically. So part of getting stakeholder involvement and engagement is to help to build, rebuild that trust with it's been depleted in the past, but also getting a sense of what those fears are most of them are probably unrealistic, but we don't, if we don't know about what those are, we can't come back and, um, and then be able to combat those kinds of misperceptions. Um, it also can help bridge cultural gaps. So again, many of us um, you know, are in academic settings. We see what that world is like, but there's a whole other culture out there that we probably don't come in contact with. And by having that stakeholder involvement, we get to hear what it really means when the doctor is saying you need to go and get this and, and, and that prescription and what the person is actually hearing. Um, we need to figure that out. We need to know what language to use and what does a term like obesity mean. We think about it clinically, but what is somebody else hearing when that comes out and talking about those nuances. It also forces researchers and providers to listen and address community needs and concerns. So as um, health providers in the room, you've got so many minutes, you've got so many patients, you're in and you're out. Um, this is a way to sort of force you to sit and listen a little bit. And oftentimes, as I hear from my um, MD colleagues, oftentimes there, there are things that are not necessarily there um, in, the, in what, what the lab results are saying and what people are saying initially that they get later on by simply talking to their patients. Um, it also helps to clarify and correct the misunderstandings and misperceptions. So I was mentioning before, people saying, oh, you're just experimenting, this has no value. Be able to help people to understand what is the point of research and how it might be helpful, that could be very um, important. And then just from the self, the, the pure <laughs> selfish reason, it actually improves your research. So talking to folks about what is the best way to recruit? Is it putting a, an ad in the UAB reporter? Or is the best way to recruit is finding somebody else that can go into churches or go into community centers or daycare centers and have a conversation with people. That can mean a wealth of difference in terms of meeting recruitment goals. It also can help you better design an intervention. If you design an intervention um, program that you want to implement that on Wednesdays at 8 a.m., um, but you know, you're trying to reach people 
who have children that are young children and that going to school or they're otherwise engaged, they can't actually get there. And that's something very simple as you might say, you know, Wednesdays at 8 a.m. is not a good time. Um, you need to just adjust the time. Or, you know, we know a lot about stress management. What we don't know about is time management. It can help you to tweak things so that you can hopefully get the outcomes you're looking for. And then compliance. So whether or not it's taking their meds or coming to a behavioral program, by getting the input of the people you're trying to target, you can help to improve the likelihood that they're going to actually follow whatever it is that you're asking them to do. Um, it's particularly important, I found, and others sort of agree, in terms of when you're trying to do work, like most of my work is in reducing and eliminating health disparities. So you're identifying a group that's more vulnerable, more likely to have a particular condition, then it's all the more reason to connect and have some engagement with that population. Because clearly, by virtue of them being a part of a group that has a disparity, that means that something is different in the, in, for them than for the, the larger group. So it can help you, for example, understand what that belief system is, um, both about health and healing and wellness. And those things tend to vary by culture. So being in the Deep South, for example, there are cultural beliefs about health and healing and wellness, about religion and religiosity and how that plays, that may be very different than someone who lives on the West Coast or in the North. Um, the same is true. A lot of my work is split between both urban settings and rural settings. So again, different belief systems where you are, um, as well as what you have access to, may vary depending on what your target audience is. And by having that input, you can really hone in on that. Um, and these belief systems, again, impact your provider-patient interactions, and they impact um, prevention and treatment recommendations as well. If you are recommending, for example, that someone is going to be um, joining a gym and walking around their neighborhood so many miles a day, um, but their neighborhood literally outside, they're on a major highway in a rural setting, that's going to be difficult for that person to do, or if there is no gym for them to join, or if that is more cost, if that is cost prohibitive, that's going to be problematic. If nothing wrong, those interventions are scientifically based, but for that population, that's probably not the best recommendation there. And you get that by involving your stakeholders and your population in those conversations. So this is the, the model what we call sort of the traditional research paragraph, the paradigm, the parachute model. You've got your grant, you've got your notice of grant award, you've worked things out with OSP here, you've got your grant account, um, you need to recruit 50 people, you're sending out your recruiter, you're going to get that information, you've got a couple of surveys, get some blood work, you're here, and then once you get that, you are gone. Um, that's traditionally what we do. We get, you know, we have our specific aims, we do our data collection, we get that data, we analyze it, we write our paper, and we move on to the next thing. It also, you know, is a model where there's very little, limited or um, no attention to what the needs are for the target population. I'm the PI, I wrote the grant, it got through study sections, you know, thank heavens, um, and then NIH had enough money to give me the money. So what do I need to know and, and input? I am the expert. Um, there's not necessarily any immediate benefit. So we do the project, we've got the publication, it makes it to a high impact journal, but where does the community benefit? It may be five years later, we've got a lot of meta-analysis, our paper is one of the most, most cited, maybe somebody tries to then implement that into clinical practice, but the immediate benefits are usually not very readily apparent. And it also breeds a high potential for harm or distrust. So when you're here, there, you're just like, you know, what can you do for me? And you're not doing anything for anyone else. It helps to perpetuate that you're just experimenting on me, you're getting what you want, and you're gone. And then that leaves a very distrusting relationship. And then there's not a whole lot about, well, what do we do when that three-year, four-year, five-year grant or one-year grant is over? If this is a really great program, people loved it, what happens when you reach the point where you spend all your money. No one's really thought about that because we're, you know, we got the publication, we got what we needed, and we're gone. So then that brings me to a different approach, um, which is community-based participatory research, and CBPR for short. So this is a definition that the Kellogg Community Scholars Program came up with um, over a decade ago, and it's, you know, really talking about a collaboration, a collaborative approach to research 
that equitably involves all partners in the research process and recognizes the unique strengths that each group brings to that table. It begins with a research topic that's of importance to the community and has the aim of combining knowledge with action and achieving social change to improve community health and eliminate health disparities. So just by raising your hand, anybody ever work on a project that you think meets this definition in any of your research activities? Yeah. What, what were you doing? Um, so this was back home in Australia. We okay. were looking to redevelop the approach that pain medicine units take to put people through the system. Okay. We had a big bottleneck at the physician level. Um, and we're trying to work out how to get around it. So kind of long story short, we had a few community kind of education days and we got a bit of feedback and we ended up starting a program where we kind of got rid of the physician as being the bottleneck and kind of made part of the process rather than sort of just being at the centre of it and sort of introduced a lot of other health professions into the, into the picture because that's kind of what the community wanted. They wanted to, to have a more kind of involved uh, assessment process rather than just being funneled out to different people. Yeah. Yeah. So from that experience, um, would you say that that was a helpful approach or or what were some of the challenges with that approach? Because I'm sure that they're both benefits as yeah. well as some limitations. That was helpful. I mean, it cut out, cut out kind of uh, cost per patient down by probably more than half and went from a waiting list of 18 months down to about four weeks. Wow. So that was kind of cool. Um, but it was very challenging because there was a lot of resistance from a lot of clinicians and there was a lot of resistance from a lot of other hospitals, although other hospitals ended up taking it on board later. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and I mean, there was also resistance from some people because some people were kind of very entrenched in that traditional model and, and when they came in and started going through the program, you know, you get a lot of kind of kickback. But the way we dealt with that was actually to say, well, if you want to go through the traditional model, you can. And actually now your access is faster because there's a whole bunch of other people who don't want it. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean I think I think the point, um, one of the things the reason why I wanted to ask that question is this is a different kind of approach. Um, it's one that I would say is probably not for many folks. Um, it does take a lot of time and I'll have some concluding comments for at the end after I show you kind of it being in place. But it can be very rewarding and I think it can be rewarding for both Party, so the mutual benefit there. Um, but the keys to that are the fact that it is collaborative. So it's not just one person having a problem. So in this example, there was a problem with an extensive waiting list for people to get care. And so that was problematic both for the patient needing care, but it was also problematic for the healthcare system as well because that was causing people you know, probably increasing costs and so on and so forth. So that was a problem and one in which at least that all the parties could say, we agree on the common problem. But it also meant that people needed to have enough of an equitable relationship that all parties felt like they were valued and respected to bring to the table what their unique issues are and their unique ideas. And so that's also something that's very difficult to do. And quite frankly, a lot of our research um, funding mechanisms make that even more challenging to really have an equitable relationship. Um, it also means that you've got to recognize that there are strengths on both places. So not just the academics, the MDs, the healthcare providers, the, the nurses, and so forth, but a community member who may have only a high school education or GED also has unique strengths and skill set and is, has expertise that needs to be valued at the table. And so, and then the last part of that is it needs to be something that's relevant and important to the community. A lot of times, you know, we you know, usually from the um, adage of public health, you know, we're you know we're from the government, we're here to help you. So we know what the problem is, we know what the solution is. You just need to get on board. But this is a different approach. We want to make sure that the community themselves actually sees that this is a problem. It's not just something you recognize, but it's something that they recognize and they value and they want to take on. So CBPR, Community Participation in Research, is not a passive involvement. It really means that you've got to be active. It's not just sitting back saying, you know, if you build it, they will come. It's also not an advising consultation. I'm just going to drop in here, give you a little bit of information and move out. 
Um, it doesn't mean exclusivity. I mean, it means that you're going to be very broad and you want to get a broad coalition, at least initially. And you might, you know, narrow it down to a few key stakeholders when you need for decision making, but you want to try to be as inclusive. Um, it's not short term. It's not a short term commitment. A lot of the projects, um, as was mentioned in the introduction, I've been at UAB probably 11 years now, but prior to that, um, spent all of my both training and, and initial faculty um, positions in Atlanta, and I still have connections with community organizations where they're still calling and asking, do you know anything about this or that? And so those are long-term commitments. And it's not just about the advancing the science. So I am, and I've achieved the rank of full professor at a major research institution, so I know the benefits and the need for advancing science. But it can't just be about that if you're doing CBPR. So it's active involvement, it's partnership and collaboration, it's inclusiveness, it's a long-term commitment, and there is some mutual benefit both to the, um, to the community and to the client at the same time. So um, Barbara Israel and colleagues um, back again more than a decade ago sort of identified in, um, in, a, in a book chapter you know, what are those core guiding principles of community-based participatory research? And there are about nine of those that were identified. First and foremost, you need to recognize the community as the unit of identity. So I mentioned earlier on about traditionally, we're really focused on individual behaviors. But this is looking at not only the individual, but the individual in the larger context of a community. So we're not isolated individuals. We interact, you know, we are individuals that live within families, within communities and neighborhoods and, and a larger society. It also begins with and builds on the strengths and resources within the community. We are very quick to say this community doesn't have this and it doesn't have that and all the negative things. But CDPR is building, it's really from a, a strength-based, it's a strength-based model. So there's got to, even in the worst, quote-unquote, worst neighborhoods and communities, there are things where people are still being resilient. So there are aspects there that you need to start with and figure out what are the things that are going well, and you build on those as opposed to continually pointing out what's wrong, because there's nothing really to build on if, it's a, if, you, know, if you have a deficit model. Third, you want to facilitate collaborative and equitable partnerships in all phases of research. So in true CVPR, um, your community folks are part of the investigative team. They're designing, they're helping you write the application, they're helping with the, the study design, they are helping with recruitment, they're helping with data collection, they're helping you to interpret that data, and they're helping you when you disseminate, so on publications and presentations. They're there the entire step of the way because that's what a partner is. Um, then it also promotes co-learning and capacity building among all partners involved. So again, you may have people with all the advanced degrees that are learning from individuals that may have no degrees, um, but that is a co-learning. So you're learning, there is a mutual, there should be a mutual respect that each party is going to learn something that's going to increase their capacity to do work going forward. It also integrates and creates a balance between generating knowledge and the mutual benefit of all partners. So again, that issue between science and service and community um, both, there needs to be a balance there. So it's not just the, the academic things, but what is the community getting at the same time. Then there's the issue of local relevance of public health problems and the ecological approaches that address these multiple determinants of health and disease. So not just talking about at the national level, we see you know, there are high rates of diabetes, for example, um, that are happening. But what is it to that local community, whether or not it's a city, a county, or state, bringing it home and making it really um, meaningful to the individual stakeholders so that, one, they can help you to better localize that intervention, but also they can hopefully see some change that can happen on the ground. It also involves systems development through sort of an iterative process. So you've got to be open to the fact that you might start something, you get some feedback, you need to be flexible to be able to make some adjustments. Then you do something else, and then you do some evaluation, and then you do some feedback. And it's a constant process of um, a iteration, a iterative process in which you're going back and forth with feedback and making adjustments. And then again, disseminating findings to all partners um, and involving all those partners in the dissemination. So for the project that I'm on, dissemination includes, again, the traditional journal articles, 
um, and you know presentations at national conferences, but it also means town hall meetings, um, going to meet with people in um, civic organizations, policy briefs, things of that nature that are not traditionally part of the dissemination methods that we use in uh, more traditional research. And again, that long-term process and commitment. And if I didn't say it at the beginning, feel free to stop and ask questions and so forth um, as I go through the presentation. Um, <clears throat> so we talked a little bit about what it is and what it isn't. Um, talk about what sort of these guiding principles are. But I hopefully will be able to tell you a little bit about why this kind of approach is important. So again, um, and actually this may be very similar, or the same slide. So again, building trust, bridging cultural gaps forcing them to address the community needs and clarifying those misunderstandings and misperceptions. Um, and then on top of that, I think the wealth and knowledge of experience of the community members is really important to have. Um, sometimes, again, there's critical information in the community that is missing that once we have that, we can actually advance the science and also advance the clinical care. Uh, we talk about improving research. It also provides some needed resources for the community. So again, I'll show you in a little while that talk about the projects we've had. We have actually been able to infuse communities with capacity, so giving people um, increased skill sets to get better jobs. But we also have provided instrumental equipment and support in communities where they might not have ever had that. And then also thinking about um, training that next generation of individuals or doing this kind of work is important because you get a diversity of individuals that may be potential students, may be you know, future researchers, and they get exposed to research, a different kind of research that may get them more excited about going on to advance their careers. Um, so again, part of the reason for the work that I do and CBPR is because, again, they haven't been tailored in the past. They don't include the participants in all aspects of the intervention design, the implementation and evaluation, and they really narrowly focus on the individual and not those broader concepts. So you're, you're as a physician or a nurse, you may be, or a behavioral scientist, you may be saying to someone, you need to get more um, physical activity, you need to eat a healthier diet, you need to lower your sugar intake, you need to lower your um, salt intake, so on and so forth. But if you live in a community where you don't have healthier access to healthy, affordable foods, you don't have opportunities for physical activity, that makes it more difficult. Even when the person has the knowledge, if you're not taking into consideration that context, then that becomes problematic for them. So then how do you create that successful team of folks doing community-based statistical research? And this is what I would argue is one of the key things if you ever think you're going to be part of those um, types of approaches or want to lead one of them. And part of it is starting with your partners and, and having those partners be key in your um, hiring decisions. So for each of our projects, we have our community members and partners to help to decide who the staff is that's going to be managing the project. Because they can see things very often a lot faster than some of us. We're looking for you know, what school did they graduate from, what was their degree, how many other publications, how many publications they have, how many other research projects. But they may be looking at, you know, how does this person respond to me? What is their eye contact? Um, how do they look at me? Um, other kinds of subtle things that would be very important to make a difference in terms of their ability to recruit, retain, and or collect information. So it's very important to have that partner to participate in that process. You also want to uh, prioritize hiring in the community. So again, our most successful CDPR projects are ones in which we hire local community members to play vital roles, paid staff roles, <coughs> um, for our projects. And that's for several reasons. One, it increases the trust um, in the community. They know the population a whole lot better than we do. They're able to get into places where we may not be allowed to get into um, and then it also provides a financial incentive, some capacity building, and so forth for those individuals as well. We also select staff and then co-investigators as well that have personal knowledge of the community, that have a positive track work record in working communities, and has decent interpersonal and facilitation skills. Again, not everybody is cut out for this kind of work, and that's perfectly fine. Um, but you want to make sure you've got the right individuals. You don't want the person to be on the team who's likely to walk into a room 
and it's going to be so stiff that they can't interact with people. They can't loosen the tie or kick off the heels and really, you know, talk um, something in a language that makes sense and is not demeaning and is not putting down um, other individuals in the room. The other part is when you're looking for staff, and again, some co-investigators, technical skills can really do the work. So we have a lot of times there are great people in the community, but they can't operate a computer, in which sometimes we need them to be able to send us things back and forth. So they need some technical skills. So sometimes we're able to, something very specific like that, we can get them trained and come on board. But there are other things that they may not be good at. So you might need to figure out, well, which roles could this individual play? Um, cultural competency skills, and that's not just about um, race or ethnicity or gender. There are other types of cultures that exist as well. So that's where they've been working in that community before, they have more comfort, um, and they're at least open and willing to understand that there are things that they may not under understand and know about, then that's really key to have that openness. And our stakeholders, our partners, will, will be able to give them more training and about, um, help on that area. Um, they need to have a demonstrated commitment to the specific topic or issue addressed by the research and the partnership process in general. This is not the kind of thing where you just tag on and say, okay, I'm going to get this. It, you really need to be committed to it. Um, it is a very um, taxing kind of relationship. I think it's very, very worthwhile. Um, but it does take a level of commitment that's beyond sort of the traditional way of you've got one project, it, it starts here, it ends there, and it moves on. And then being able to transcend the community and the university cultures. Those are very different cultures. Um, a presentation that I would do to the, with the community is likely not to have a PowerPoint, for example, where I'm sitting and giving people handouts and lecturing. It's going to be a, a very different type of environment. And so I need to know what that culture is. I need to know who do I talk to in an academic setting and who makes the decision. And that's probably different than the kind of person who's going to make the decision in a community level. So being able to go back and forth between those two um, those worlds. So then, you know, why would anybody do this? Um, what's in it from a researcher standpoint? Why you might want to do this kind of work? Um, I mean, I personally feel, and I think it's you know um, enough is in the literature to suggest that these tend to be more realistic and feasible programs and interventions when you involve stakeholders. They also um, you know, get the researcher a chance to gain more marketable skills. So there aren't very many people that do this line of work, and as it becomes more and more valuable, um, like I said, there's a whole patient-centered um, outcomes research initiative that is forcing this. And so uh, more and more of these are skill sets that people want you to have. Um, it's also a way to help both ourselves um, as individuals, so um, our loved ones and our community members to improve their health as well. So a lot of the CDPR that I'm involved in happens to be in communities that I'm very concerned about, um, including some of the communities in which I live in. It can also, um, speaking, putting on my hat as a NIH um, study section permanent member, it also can make for a much more competitive grant application, more successful programs, increased opportunities for dissemination of the work in public health service. So you know, it, it makes a difference in our study section when you come through and you engaged community members because we think that's likely to be a little bit more feasible than ideas that were only generated by investigators. And again, for the line of work that I do in health disparities uh, research, it perhaps can reduce health disparities as well by involving those disparate populations in all aspects of the research. And then for the community, again, this is a mutual beneficial arrangement, ideally. Um, it can give the additional resources to aid and meet, meet the community needs. So I mentioned projects that we've worked on where we do, for example, primarily my research is in nutrition, physical activity, and obesity prevention. We might buy equipment, for example, that stays in the community. It was for the community originally. We usually don't need it. We write them into every grant. So we can leave that kind of equipment there that also gets that issues of sustainability. They can run the programs. Most of our interventions are manualized, so there's a curriculum that's left behind. We've already trained people. That can always be a, a very good thing to sort of lead with very limited costs personally to us at, at the academic side. It also can have more successful programs to improve the health of community members, the people they care for, and others in their social network. So part of the reason why people said, I don't want to be in research, I don't see the outcome. You give me this, this pill, it may or may not be you know, actually effective. I don't see an immediate thing there. 
but by them being part at every stage and they see the outcomes, they see the results, um, then that may also be leading to a more successful program. You have an established network to generate additional resources. Um, so again, um, one of the things that we do, we go back to some of the same networks over and over again because they have increased <coughs> level of training, they have the skill sets we need. Um, it also is helpful because if you concentrate your resources in one area, you're more likely to see um, demonstrated changes, not only at the individual level, but you start seeing it at the community level and hopefully the population level at some point. And then opportunity to expose a larger audience to the strengths and resources existing in communities. So again, we do a pretty decent job of pointing out what's wrong um, with individuals and communities. We don't do as good a job of saying what's right. So this is a way for communities to help to um, frame those results in a way that can showcase their assets um, to, to the larger audience. And again, perhaps the reduction of the share. <coughs> so I'm going to transition now to talk about kind of what PDPR is, um, what it's not, and why it's important, but want to show you a little bit about what CDPR is in action as it's been related to a um, now 15, 16 year old um, academic community partnership here at UAB called the Deep South Network for Cancer Control. And the main focus of the Deep South Network is eliminating cancer disparities in the Deep South. So, um, Again, probably not any surprise to the folks in this room, but cancer is the second leading cause of death in the United States. Um, in 2013, more than 584,000 individuals died from cancer. And beyond just the obvious loss of life, we also know that the estimated $264 billion um, in 2010 was as a result of individuals um, having um, dealt with the cost of cancer, both their direct cost and loss of productivity and illness of premature death. Um, and then we also know currently there are about 14 million people in the U.S. that have a current or prior cancer diagnosis. So for, for many reasons, cancer continues to be um, an issue that has significant public health, uh, public health significance, and in particular here in the Deep South, because there are um, as we know and as NCI has recognized, there are some cancer health disparities. So NCI defines cancer health disparity as an adverse difference in cancer incidence, either the new cases, the cancer prevalence, all existing cases, cancer death, mortality, cancer survivorship, and burden of cancer or related health conditions that exist among specific populations and groups in the United States. So basically anywhere where you see there's a difference between um, incidents for prevalence, death, survivorship, or burden between any group of individuals. That can be between urban and rural individuals, it could be with, um, across racial ethnic groups, it could be across genders. That's sort of wrapped up in the definition that NPI calls in terms of cancer health disparity. And, and this is just at least one sort of um, graphic of what we might be talking about when it comes to race and ethnicity. So, what, if anything, sort of um, strikes you by this particular graph from the American Cancer Society? Not a trick question. <laughs> more men than women. Okay. So across um, the racial ethnic groups, more men than women tend <laughs> to die from cancer using this data set from 2005-2009. Anything else? African -Americans. And African Americans tend to have overall across the groups a higher rate. Um, so what what do you think are some of the reasons behind those disparities, either by race, ethnicity, or gender? Lack of access to health care. Okay. So perhaps limited access to health care among those who are have higher death rates as well. Absolutely. What about that? <laughs> Oftentimes, African American men don't seek care like they should okay. uh, on a regular basis. Okay, so delay of um, treatment seeking, which may result in uh, later diagnosis, which then might increase higher mortality. Okay. Anything else? Tumor biology. Tumor biology, yeah. So there are certain things that might, for certain cancers, um, the actual biology may be different, and therefore there may be more aggressive um, types of cancers in certain groups than others. Don't men just do riskier things in general? Um, as a married lady, I think so. 
do more, un, you know, smoking and drinking. And so, so maybe higher rates of health behaviors that may have you at a greater risk of certain types of cancer. So all of these are great hypotheses about what's going on and what could be there. And that is how you generate research studies and knowledge and try to go out and figure out which and, you know, sort of see what's happening. So some of those things might be the case. And what ended up happening uh, in addition to those are what, if anything, strikes you about this particular map. So if you can't see over the side, the red is the highest, and that's the age-adjusted annual death rates. And so that red is 185 to 200, I think. Um, the darker blue is 125 to 157. Mm -hmm. Is it other than Georgia? Black belt. Yeah, I mean, Georgia has more rates, but okay. Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, okay. Alabama, Tennessee, it's all. Deep South, yeah. So, so most of the Deep South, um, traditionally uh, called Deep South states, have a much higher rate of um, um, death from cancer. And these are all cancers, all genders, all races and ethnicities. Um, but that pattern seems to to really sort of match some other maps you guys probably have seen as well. What, how does this relate to some other maps that you might have seen about health conditions? HIV, STD, HIV, STD, obesity, stroke, stroke your diabetes. There, I mean, the maps are very, very similar. If you look at the CDC map, there's something going on in this region in particular that um, probably predisposes individuals to higher rates of these chronic conditions, including cancer. So, um, and one other unequal burden that that uh, highlight here is that in rural areas, in particular. Um, you also have limited health care facilities and other resources, um, limited modes of transportation. So we take for granted, you know, if you need to go in there, if there is a health care system, we take for granted that there's somebody with a car or there's, you know, you can walk or there's public transportation. But oftentimes in rural settings, there isn't that level of transportation to be able to get back and forth. Um, they're also, on average, tend to have, um, those communities have lower incomes. Um, so that may be a challenge. And they also spend more time working. So if you believe it or not, actually folks in rural areas work more um, on average than folks in urban areas. And how might that play a role in disparity? You work longer hours or more hours. Don't have time to go to the doctor. And how many doctors' offices do you know that are open at 9 p.m. or 8 p.m. or on Saturday or Sunday? So again, um, in terms of access, it's not only is the building not there, but it, is it accessible to the individuals at the time in which they need it? Um, rural residents tend to focus more on treatment than prevention. So I'm going to go into the, the ER, go see the nurse or the health practitioner when something's <clears throat> falling off or it's bleeding profusely, um, not just to kind of go in and get my checkup and, you know, hey, do you have some ideas of what I can do to lose this 10 pounds, that kind of thing. Um, and then there are um, higher rates of obesity and tobacco use. So again, those health behaviors that predispose to all the things we were just talking about tend to be higher in rural communities than in others. So um, the National Cancer Institute was sort of proactive and, and probably the first of the institutes within NIH to really latch on to this idea of health disparity and the idea of the potential benefit of community-based particular research to be able to address this. So one of the things that they did um, back in, I think, 1999, was they tried to focus on efforts to reduce the unequal burden of cancer in the U.S. and train the next generation of competitive researchers in cancer and cancer health disparities research. So it took a very proactive um, initiative to sort of say, we're going to create this center to reduce cancer health disparities, and these are the primary goals here. To date, that CRCHD, in addition to funding R01s and other kinds of traditional um, funding mechanisms, they have funded three very large um, grant programs that focus exclusively on CDPR. The first one was the Special Populations Network, so SPN, which was from 2000 to 2005. Following that, they went to Community Networks Program from 2005 to 2010. And then currently, they have um, the Community Networks Program Centers um, from 2010 to 2015. 
And so we've been quite fortunate here at UAB. We've been a recipient of all three of those initiatives, and that's the Deep South Network for Cancer uh, Control. So under the leadership of Dr. Ed Partridge, who's our Cancer Center Director, um, as well as his uh, right-hand person, Claudia Hardy, the Program Director, from 2000 to 2005, UAB partnered with UA and the University of Southern Mississippi to create a community infrastructure to increase cancer awareness in the African American population in rural areas and urban areas of Alabama and Mississippi. So picking up on those maps, picking up on the graph where issues were highest among African American populations, they were highest um, in the Deep South and in particular along rural areas. That um, particular initiative is for those five years really focused on creating an infrastructure to do cancer awareness. So it included national, state, and local partners at the national level, the American Cancer Society at the state level, both in Alabama and Mississippi, you had the Medicare Quality Improvement, and you had the Breast and Cervical Cancer Early Detection Program. And then there were other local partnerships, 53 of those in Alabama and 46 of those in Mississippi, that included things like smaller health departments, it included community-based um, um, organizations, civic groups, you name it, folks who were saying, I'm interested and I want to be at the table were involved in this larger partnership. And what was also um, the cornerstone of this particular initial infrastructure and has sort of permeated through the rest of them as well, is this idea of community health advisor as research partners. So who's heard of community health advisors before? And what's a community health advisor? Um, Team looking at boots on the ground. Okay. So they're actually out in the communities building those relationships and Okay. And you have anything to add? So what what is the community health advice? Yeah, it's a lay person that's <clears throat> trained to do what this gentleman just mentioned. Okay, good. Okay. Trying to put those boots on and get on the ground, right? So so these are folks who for our project were, you know, we call them indigenous to the community. And what they are are our link between sort of the academic, the healthcare system and the community. So these are people who live in the community. They're the neighbors of the participants that we want to involve. They're the school teachers. They're, you know, they're, they're right there in the community. They go to the same grocery stores and, and so on and so forth. But we basically bring them in and do a little bit more training. Uh, we're not training them to be healthcare providers. We're not training them to be academic researchers. We're just giving them factual information so they can disseminate that information in a way that is much more comfortable to the community at large. So it's not people coming with white coats or suits and ties. It's the folks that they're normally going to see in the grocery store anyway. And in the middle of that, they're going to start talking about some of the things that are relevant. So we, um, so the community health advisors sort of framework is sort of what is normally um, considered. We added on the as research partners because again, for the CDPR, these are the folks who are part of from the very beginning and writing the grant and helping us to do all of that. So we call ours CHARPS. So they were, um, the CHARPS were uh, led through a series of um, cancer awareness and education training. And so the grant primarily talked about creating these awareness and screening messages that targeted these underserved communities. I think a total of about 22 counties, in fact, were targeted in that initial five-year grant. They utilized eight key messages as were developed by an education committee that included both academic investigators and community investigators to come up with just eight key things that they kept repeating over and over again. There was a different message that they may have for five months. But again, it's very, very specific. It's factual, um, but it's not overwhelming. We're not training them to be you know, healthcare providers. Um, close to uh, or over 1,500 community education activities were held and over 116,000 um, people were reached in that original cancer awareness and education um, aspect of the project. From there, so that infrastructure, that, that first grant was just about creating an academic community infrastructure. It's getting the people involved, getting them connected making sure that they were ready to activate when something else came up. And lo and behold, NCI found that these programs were successful. There were, I think, about 23 or more across the country. And so they reissued another request. And this time, they wanted it 
um, for the idea of doing more population-based interventions. So beyond awareness and education and linking people in to get screened, they want to say, okay, well, are, you know, can you use um, and these beneficial cancer interventions and also can you make sure you start training other folks to do this work when the senior folks like Dr. Partridge get you know, ready to retire or start, um, start producing the number of grants. And then also, you know, keep on with your cancer awareness because there's still a lot of disparities there. So again, the same partners were involved, the same 22 counties across Alabama and Mississippi were involved. And this time around, the project included the development of a community action plan. And that's where investigators went out, staff went out, talked to community members, so they could say, well, what do you want to do? So very much at the beginning um, and in the application, it was written about certain things that, that the group was going to target. I think tobacco might have been one of the things because of the, the interest of one particular investigator, and there was something else there. Um, but again, in the application, it said we're going to spend the first year or so of the grant going back to make sure that that's exactly what all the folks in the population wanted. And lo and behold, that was not what people said. So while a few people said that was good for the application, they wanted a more extensive process. And at the end of the day, people said, you know what, we're starting to get wind that there's something around this issue of overweight, overweight and obesity. We want to tackle that because we're seeing things in the news saying obesity may be linked to cancer. And so the entire project had to be sort of revamped to focus on things like physical activity, nutrition, um, continue the cancer awareness. And then the advocacy piece also happened because this was around the time when both Alabama and Mississippi started talking about significantly cutting early detection programs and other things. And so people said, you know, we want to get be able to galvanize and go back to our policymakers and stop them from cutting these valuable resources. Because you already told us five years, you know, in the five years before this, that part of the reason why we have higher mortality is people not getting into treatment or they're getting in later. And we've been telling people get in early, but when they go, they can't afford it or the services aren't there. So they wanted the advocacy as well. So the community action plan included continued awareness and programs, um, but also to add colorectal cancer. So the original five years focused on breast, cervical, and breast and cervical were the primary um, focus areas and maybe ovarian cancer. But <clears throat> part of the other thing that the community said is that we're having a higher rate of colorectal cancer, but you haven't talked about that anymore. So the group added that on as a area, priority area as well. So these are just a couple of pictures and showing our community health advisors. They do health fairs. Um, they have different meetings in the community, um, in particular for um, trying to get out a lot of men. They have you know, men's events to try to get them out and talk to other men. Um, lots of different things. They have walking programs that exist as well to be in the community and um, deliver the intervention. The other thing that this part of the project did was to sort of make, um, provide more innovative ways to do the education. So different games that would help, sort of bingo games and Jeopardy type games to get those eight key messages out, family feud and so forth. So it's not just here's a pamphlet, you know, go read this and sort of the sterile things that you get. Um, through a, a, a health uh, agency, but to really get people excited about it and having those monthly meetings and engaging individuals um, with those key messages. And then again, if there was a walk program, so this is an evidence-based program um, actually originally developed through the Minority Health and Health Disparity Center here at UAB, where close to 1,900 members from over 200 teams got together and they would walk on a regular basis. So individuals were given t-shirts, they were given pedometers, they were given little cards to kind of write down their steps and they were given goals for 10,000 steps a day and they kept up with that. Um, tw all 22 of the 22 counties in the, the, um, implemented one of those walk teams and they consisted of a volunteer, either our community health advisors, research partners, um, or the CMPs, which are community network partners, so those 53 and 40, whatever, out of the two states, they led that. And so the only reason why they were the leaders is because they were in charge of taking up all the, the step cards so we could evaluate the program. But they were the team leaders. They would motivate, encourage, and educate. Um, at six months, um, close to 80% of the people were still walking on a regular basis. Um, at, at a year later, 61, more than half of them were still doing that. And then at two years later, exactly half of the folks who were in this population-based study 
watching staying active in their walk teams on a regular basis. The other part about the dietary intervention was the Body and Soul program. So this is an NCI evidence-based program that's delivering health messages through traditionally um, larger African-American churches. So the idea here is to <clears throat> infuse the health messages with messages that people were hearing on Sunday or on Wednesday Bible study or whatnot to sort of link up the idea of eating healthy as it relates to your religion. So interestingly enough, when I came to UAB, I worked on this project, but I worked previously at Emory um, when I was on faculty there on the research studies that led to body and soul. So it was really nice to see it go from a research study to be an implementation study and disseminate it more broadly. So we had 53 churches, over 2,500 people participated. Uh, again, it integrated the cancer awareness messages in with religious messages, and it was more of a systems change. So if any of you have ever attended a church in the Deep South, um, more traditional, particularly Baptist church, and you stayed over for, for um, some kind of food event, um, you can see that there's a lot of need for changes in terms of dietary habits there. And that's where it really aimed at both the systems level, but also the individual level as well. We saw a 30% reduction in the number of people who reported having no fruit and vegetable consumption at a year and a half later. So amazingly, um, most of the people in the sample at the baseline had no fruit and vegetable intake in the previous week in, in terms of our assessment. And then there's the advocacy. So I mentioned the fact that during the time of the development of this application, there were a lot of key budget cuts that were happening at the state level across both states. And so the American Cancer Society agreed to develop an advocacy training program for our project. And so they made people aware of their power to impact change in their health system, identified opponents, champions, and a sponsor for the health issue, and then also built you know, relationships with supporters and finding that local issue. So again, recognizing, yet there are national issues, but finding that local story and being able to um, impactfully go and build that grassroots and legislative support to um, do statewide initiatives like the smoke-free workplace law, law and tobacco sales tax. And again, for Alabama in particular, it was um, at least a couple years in a row was able to stave off some of the deep cuts that were happening in the early detection program. And then probably the most um, significant and most impactful Theme from the first 10 years of the project this was this data that showed that um, over the course of the 10 years that the Deep South Network had been employed, <clears throat> that there was actually an elimination of the disparities in mammogram screening among um, residents in Alabama. So taking Medicare data, looking at um, the year of 1997 and 1998 prior to starting the Deep South Network, you saw that there was a difference between um, white women in yellow and black women in green, there was a significant difference somewhere around, you know, 15 or, or more points in terms of those individuals who um, were eligible and could get mammograms through Medicare, uh, but did not get them. Yeah. Oh, right. This uh, individual was in 22 of the Alabama counties? Well, 22 across the two states. So I think it was 12 in Alabama and, um, and 10 in Mississippi. So, so this difference, I think, is very, very impressive. But I guess my question is, was that difference true in intervention and in non-intervention counties? So for these programs, we there wasn't a control condition. So this is all the communities, all the counties got um, got this community health advisor type of training and got individuals to do that. Not in this particular paper that was published in the American Journal of Public Health, but I think there's either a current paper that's under review, um, or it might have already been impressed, in which we did the very thing that you're talking about, go back and look at counties that were part of the Deep South Network versus not, and it still reigns true that those that were part of the Deep South Network tended to have the elimination of the um, uh, greater reduction and or elimination of the disparity between mammogram compared to counties that did not have this infrastructure in there. So by the time you got to the end of this um, first 10 years in 2008, the difference was did not exist um, um, in terms of black and white women. And, but still, overall, there was work to be done, given that still slightly less than 60% of the women who were eligible, again, these are Medicare um, 
uh, mammogram screening data from from uh, from the state, and so everyone was at age and had that as a Medicare benefit. So the issue of being able to afford it and so forth was taken off the table. So we still have a lot of work to be done. But. Um, and then lastly, we come to the current time. So this is the 2010 to 2015 NCI. Um, at some point, kind of um, with probably the change in the director said, hey, wait a minute, these community-based programs are fine, but at the end of the day, we're researchers. We need to go back to doing things like randomized control trials, and we need to figure out is this just a fluke or, you know, is this really different? So in this particular grant, um, we actually shift partners. So maybe then now um, partners with the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Um, and the focus here was, again, for both cancer screening and healthy behaviors, but also to evaluate the efficacy of community-based participatory um, culturally relevant intervention to basically reduce weight among African American women. Um, and that's kind of where we are today. So this application grew out of, again, increasing conversations with our community partners about the links between obesity and cancer. So we know that healthy diet can sustain a healthy weight and lower the risk of cancer. We also know that, that sort of separately, uh, independently, regular physical activity protects against the buildup of excess body fat and against cancer independently. And then also, overweight and obesity contribute to an estimated 20% of all cancer-related deaths. So again, we were getting pressure from the people that we were working with. It's great that you taught us about all this information. It's great that you've shown us where we can go to get screening. We know that early detection saves lives, but are there other things we can do? And they really told us we want, they wanted to focus on overweight and obesity. So again, as I mentioned before, different maps and so forth. Um, this is one that sort of looks at just the trends of overweight prevalence among adults in the U.S. from 1992 to 2010. And as you see, beginning in, I mean, from, at 2010 and beyond, um, more than 55% uh, of the entire U.S. has a prevalence of um, or are overweight. And so here we're defining overweight as a body mass index of greater than 25 um, kilograms per meter square. So, so the fact is, this is not only a problem in the deep south, it's a problem nationwide, but more specifically, it is a uh, significant challenge here. So this is a paper um, that came out of the CDC that looks at just U.S. adults living in the south by race and ethnicity. And similar to some of the other things we talked about, higher rates overall among African Americans are not Hispanic Blacks. Um, and then also some gender differences here, at least among Blacks, with women being having higher rates. And that's going up to, um, in terms of obesity, which is BMI of 30 and greater, at over 40% of African American women living in the Deep South um, having um, a classification of obesity. Similarly, when we talk about the separate thing of physical activity independent of your obesity status, um, physical inactivity among rural residents. So the group that has um, this figure on the y-axis is the prevalence of physical inactivity, meaning no physical activity. The highest rates of physical inactivity, getting closer to about 37% or so, is among rural residents. So again, people in this area are not getting a lot of physical activity. Um, and then lastly, we talk about with CDPR, it's not just the individual, but we're talking about the larger context. So unique social and cultural perspectives and environments have also been suggested as barriers to energy balance around, among racial, ethnic, minority populations. So cultures of eating and what you eat, um, the cultures that relate food and food consumption to love and affection, um, those kinds of things, as well as um, what's culturally accepted in terms of physical activity and body weight and body shape and so forth may also play a role here. So all those things taken together, we developed an intervention program um, within that larger center grant. There's a full research project that was kind of an R01 type uh, five-year study within that larger grant. And so we have the Journey to Better Health program. I'm the lead project leader for the full research project. And what we're trying to do is test evidence-based strategies supporting weight loss among overweight African-American women in the Deep South. And anyone curious about why we chose that population? Or have any reasons or suggestions why? Maybe they're, well, for an, maybe initially they're more likely to be compliant, and, uh, I don't know, just for an initial project, or maybe they can 
influence other people in their families, uh, head, of, head of the household. Uh, Okay, so maybe some influence for many other stuff. So do the cooking? Maybe oh, yeah. you do, yeah, particularly traditionally these stuff, still doing a lot of cooking, okay. They're most effective. They're most effective, yeah. So so 80, close to 80% of African American women nationwide are either overweight or obese. So if you're talking about weight loss, that's the population that has that risk factor, has a more prevalence of that risk factor. But they also tend, particularly in the deep south, tend to be the ones that are doing cooking and have a good deal of influence on others in their lives. So not only are they talking about what's coming into their bodies, but they're dictating what spouses and other folks in their community or in their household might be eating, and particularly their children and child care. So we got a lot of pushback. So we talk about pushback from community. We got a lot of pushback, and we said we wanted to focus on African American women from our community members because they said, what if, you know, the, the guys in the room said, what about us? And they said, what about the kids? Um, we had to say, realistically, we don't have enough money to do everything to everybody, but we think we can, if we get the women, we potentially have the ability to sort of permeate through the rest of the family. So what we ended up doing was um, <clears throat> coming up with a study design, and what do you think? So there's a 24-month weight loss versus 24-month weight loss plus community strategies um, to support healthy eating and physical activity. What's wrong with this study design, if anything? What are we missing here? The community-based participatory aspects of it? Not quite, but what else? Oh, I was going with that, like just having that on its own, like as a kind of a control. Right. Just so we, control. A control. We don't have a control group there that gets it just gets the the cancer awareness and education. Did I just forget that? Why do you think that's not? Because you think it's what? Because I think it works. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> what? Why, why else? What well, the community members told you? Hmm. What the community members told? So. So yes, yeah, so I have been taught um, randomized controlled trials and the best methodology, you've got a control group, you've got an intervention group, you may have more than one intervention group, but you need that control. So that's exactly the way I wrote it initially, went to the community and they said no way. Why do you think they said no way? They wanted to at least get something for it to be worth their time. They, you don't wanna... they wanted to get something all along for 10 years, got a partnership team and everybody's been saying, you know, you've got to change your diet, you need to do physical activity, you know, we have these higher rates of cancer here, you know, they started getting more, this is right when the popular flesh press started getting on top of obesity and cancer, they're hearing messages, and then we want to say, oh, but, you know, we want to give you a program for two years, you just kind of stay, stay still. Um, but we've got these other evidence-based programs that we know that, we, that people can lose weight, and you're okay with being randomized to one of these, and they said no. So we had to come back with a design that looks like it. So it was sort of an additive design. Um, of course, in our brand application when we wrote it, we, we argued that this was true CDPR. We couldn't get that. Um, it was not fair to our partners over this 10-year you know, span of time to ask them to agree, and they wouldn't have agreed if we asked them. So we came up with this. Again, it's not an ideal model, um, but that's what we had. But, I mean, but, I mean, can't you still consider this as a control or a treatment group, with the treatment being the community strategies? It, it is. I mean, it, and it it passed muster, so it got we got funded. So it, it, we had a decent enough rationale. At the end of the day, though, if we ask the question, but is this level of difference? If we find a difference better than doing nothing at all, we can't answer that because we didn't study that. So that is a limitation of the study. But again, we move forward because of the nature of our partnership. We felt very strongly about it. Um, just as an anecdote, I have an R01 study that has something very similar. I've got a control group um, in that, but and not, you know, I guess we have a little bit more time. I can tell you how I managed to get that in there, but but it is um, it, it was challenging. But in the context of this application, we were able to argue that. So basically, we we are take the 24 month weight loss program as a behavioral weight loss program that's adapted from a ton of evidence based behavioral trials. So I'm sure many of you heard of the Dash, Premier. Uh, weight loss maintenance trial. So it's your standard 20 session or so um, group-based program where you're taught things around healthier eating, 
and being more physically active, the tried and true, it gets, it gets you the 5 to 10% weight loss on average from all the participants. So we, we wanted to do that. Um, but our twist is it's not delivered by psychologists. It's not delivered by um, dietitians or nurse practitioners or so forth. It's delivered by our trained local staff. So that's the twist on the intervention. And then we also knew around the same time we were writing an application that there was all these community-based strategies that came out. CDC came out with a whole document about it's not just the individual but the community. And so what we're thinking as sort of our more bang for the buck is when you have that group-based program plus you have community strategy, then those are the folks who are going to likely do better, um, um, get more weight loss, and maintain it over time. So our primary outcome, uh, hypothesis are weight loss will be greater in the weight loss program plus community strategies or group two than group one that just has the group weight loss program alone. And then we're looking at clinical outcomes, blood pressure, lipids, glucose, healthy eating pattern, um, physical activity, and so on and so forth. So it's a huge team. Um, it includes myself as the PI, um, investigators uh, from across both um, Alabama and Mississippi. We have a junior trainee. Again, the NCI is interested in training other investigators to continue this work. Um, we also have a community advisory group. So these are the folks that keep us on target all the time. So they are the ones that tell us, you guys are off base. This is never going to work. Um, go back to the drawing board. They're constantly telling us when we need to revamp things. We have people in the central office. But the bulk of the work happens here. These are all of our local paid staff, and that does not include our community health advisors. We have over 120 community health advisors that are through these um, only, only eight, we're in eight counties, so they're through those eight counties that help us also deliver the intervention. And then we have a team of folks that go out to do our clinical assessments. So it's a pretty big group that runs the project. Um, let me check in a little bit. So I've got about 9.20. Um, I'm happy we can stop and take a 10-minute break if people want to do that. Or possibly go maybe 15 more minutes and I'll be done. Anyone want to power through? Yes. OK. All right. All right. Good. Um, so just briefly, I'm going to tell you a little bit about, and I think for for these, you don't have handouts for these, for I think most of these things, so I'll, I'll kind of walk through them a little bit. Our first aim was basically just to figure out what those community strategies are and get them implemented. <clears throat> and for that, we did several things. We went and go out and, and affect the community. So these are eight rural communities, only four in each state. So we had our local uh, regional uh, and county coordinators to go out to grocery stores and basically see what's available using a standardized measure. What they looked at what was available in terms of healthier foods. We modified a little bit because if the traditional measure looks at only um, fresh produce, but we realize in rural areas that's not the only place that people get their produce, and it's not necessarily the only thing that can be healthy. There are certainly um, frozen vegetables and fruits that can be used that are healthy and also can, um, particularly when they're not packed in sugar and all kinds of preservatives. So we looked at what they had available from a nutrition standpoint. We also looked at what was available for physical activity using a specific tool for rural active living. Um, and again, had our local community folks to do a time-wide assessment, do a program and policy assessment, and then look at individual street segments. So a very short checklist, about three pages long, where community members would walk certain streets that we would identify through GIS mapping, and they check off. Is it walkable? Do they have sidewalks with a speed limit here? Would you feel comfortable? Do you think it looks pleasing? Would you would you actually walk here and give us some information? And then lastly, we had them to do a photo voice project. And I'm not sure if some of you have heard of photo voice before, but it's a very interactive, um, really neat way to get an, a better sense or a better picture, if you will, about what community uh, members see. So this was a project where we gave community members uh, cameras, asked them for a week or so to take pictures of things in their community that either got in the way or helped them in terms of maintaining a healthy lifestyle. And then they gave us the cameras back, we got the, the pictures, um, we looked at the pictures, and then we invited them back for a focus group. So that's the photo and the voice. And we selected um, some of their top photos to display for the focus group and had them to share with us some information about the photos, why they picked them, and what was happening. 
So these are three pictures that were identified. So somebody talked about, you know, something that was healthy by having a local garden there. Um, that was helpful, having physical activity, having playgrounds, because even though they were adults that we were targeting for the project, um, uh, adults going out with kids would engage them in being more active, more active. They would walk around the track. And then what do you think is happening here in this last, this bottom picture with the, um, from the gas station? What do you think people might have said here? So people said, so the person who took the picture, I can't remember which of those things, why they took it, but somebody else in the room said the other thing. So somebody's tone is, so yes, one of the, the pizza guys who's twirling the, the dough in his hand, so that's a pizza, but somebody else was saying it's about gas. So that's the other beauty of the photo voice. The picture taker might have one thing in mind, but everybody in the room might see it differently, and all of that information is very valuable. This is a great participatory tool. It doesn't require anybody to have an advanced degree. Um, usually the cameras will point and click, you know, shoot, we do train them on how to use them and so forth, but it's really equalizing for it and powerful for them to see different things come to life. So we did that, and then we took that information and we fed it back to the community. And we said, this is what we found about your local community. This is, the, this is what your nutrition environment, your physical activity environment. These are the other things that get in the way. And then we had them pick amongst a select group of these community strategies that the CDC put out. So our community advisory group said, these are the things that I think would work in rural areas. And so we gave them a select menu and said, you need to apply for some resources that we have where you can um, proposed to do one thing about healthy eating and one thing around physical activity. So we had those feedback meetings. We gave them a request for application. I think it was maybe three pages long, not very detailed, where they said what they wanted to do. And then those applications were reviewed, scored, and ranked by our team members, which include investigators, staff, and a community advisory group. From there, um, I'll show you a little bit later on, but from there we then award. So we gave funds. Uh, for them to do each of those um, activities for two years. They were funded for two years to do those activities. So the second part was to take that those evidence-based programs and adapt them for our African-American um, women who are living in rural communities. And so what we ended up doing, again, taking those traditional 20-week sessions that are from those um, larger trials, and then we adapted them to be led by our regional and local coordinators, um, they had a goal, like the, like the evidence-based trial, 5 to 10% weight loss by coming to sessions, keeping track of their food and physical activity loss. Um, we gave them a special, a certain number of calories per day that they should aim for based on their baseline weight and how much we wanted to change, usually about a 500 or so calorie deficit per day. Um, eating five or more fruits and vegetables, getting 150 minutes of physical activity a week. So that happened for six months. That's your weekly session. They then transitioned to the second phase where we were slowly kind of transitioning, transitioning them to be on their own. So then they went to face-to-face -face meetings um, twice a month for three months and then once a month for three months. And this time it's just the local coordinator, so just that person in their county, and they're being helped all along through our community health advisors. Again, unlike some of the other longer weight loss maintenance trials, if they, if they didn't make the 5% weight loss goal or tie to 10 at phase one, we didn't kick them out of the study. They just kept going on. It's like real world. If you didn't make it, re, you know, regroup, still try to make it. If you didn't make it, then the idea was about maintaining. And then the last phase, which is the last year, monthly motivational phone calls that are only led by our volunteers. So there are volunteers are trained to call up once a month and say, how's it going? What are your problems? How can I help and stay connected with them? So again, the very traditional topics, the 20 sessions, you know, what is physical activity, what a portion size is, you know, how can you do a better job of planning your meals, uh, preparing them, getting family support, stress management, time management, things of that nature. And again, I mentioned the manuals, so we have the manuals there. So again, the individuals that are trained don't necessarily have any advanced training but we walk them through, we, we give them training, we bring them here, we train them in group skills, um, and then they follow through with a manual on how they deliver certain things. So they have key skills that they have, um, so on the left is what the facilitator will have, and on the right, the participant gets kind of a one-pager and any handout 
all in a nice binder so that even if they miss a session, they can kind of catch up and see what's going on. They also get progress reports, so they track their weight over time. So there's a 5% weight, 10% uh, bar here in terms of their weight loss of 5%, and then it tracks over time where they are. And there's a tailored message that sort of says, you're on track, you know, do X, Y, Z. If you're not on track, to stay motivated, so forth. If you notice at all, what we use for the journey, journey to better health, journey point, things of that nature, that title of the intervention program was developed by the community members. They didn't want anything about weight loss obesity in the title. They also wanted it to be reflective that it's not a, a simple thing, that it is a journey, that you, and, and the, the image itself doesn't show you where the end is, and that's also reflected that they may not get to that 5 to 10 percent there, but it's a lifestyle change that's going on. We do give incentives, so depending on the points that they get for turning in their journals and other things that get points, they can use it to get all nice, nice little trinkets that we have that have the logo on it. And then, like I said, the monthly motivational calls at the end, people are sort of similar to motivational interviewing, but not motivational interviewing per se, but you're asking people, what is your confidence that you're going to do X, Y, Z? What would it take for you to get to that next level? What can we do? What are the barriers? So it's just to keep them motivated and keep moving. So then lastly, we're evaluating the project. So I mentioned we, um, we awarded four of these grants um, to community members. They expanded farmers markets. They gave incentives to um, to purchase from farmers markets, they did park improvements, indoor walking trails. These are rural communities, and you know, five to ten thousand dollars goes a long way. And that's kind of the level of the the uh, funding that they receive. They're able to do a whole lot there and leverage what they had going on. Um, we also targeted 400 individuals. We had a lot of more traditional um, and eligibility criteria originally, but we ended up having to change that a little bit because we found that. A lot of our women initially were much heavier than the, the higher cutoff for BMI. So we had to go back and change it so that the BMI was just 25 and older. We also had to change it that some people in rural areas live in one area, but they may work in a different area and so forth. And it was a lot more fluid and flexible than traditionally in urban areas. And so this was feedback we got from our community advisory group when we were having the first time we had a slow recruitment. So we went and made those adjustments. Um, in that particular, um, in the project. So we ended up with 409 women enrolled, so we met, uh, slightly exceeded our eligibility criteria, but it took 921 women to be screened to get to that number. What we have is a multiple section um, in terms of eligibility. There's some screening that happens from our local coordinator, then there's a second screening that happens by phone with our staff here at UAB, and then there's an actual baseline assessment where we collect the information. So 494 women ended up being invited to the baseline, 409 ended up being enrolled, and the vast majority of the folks who did not make it had some kind of chronic comorbid condition. And the reason why we could not accept them is that we're not getting healthcare services. So if something was happening in the community, we couldn't ensure their safety, for example. So we had the eight counties, again, four in each group randomized. Um, this may be a little bit difficult to see, but the main thing is that we only have lost, I think, total of six people. And so we retained um, 403 right now at this point. We're very close to getting done with our 24-month assessment. Um, early on, what you see is that we've got uh, a very diverse group of individuals, both in terms of our group one and group two. Um, a lot of individuals sort of in that middle still what most would sort of consider working poor in terms of economic um, um, income, um, some diversity in terms of education, majority of them having high school, and the vast majority of individuals um, having some kind of um, um, either currently single or not living with a partner. A lot of that has to do with um, some of our older populations, widows, and so forth. Uh, retention, as I said, we do a lot of things to retain folks, and that's where the local community is very helpful. We've lost very, very few individuals throughout that. Um, so this is our retention at six months and 12 months. So again, um, you know, we're we're at 98.8 at 12 months, and and with our we've done um, three fourths of the 24 months at this point, and we're still very much at 95, 97 percent um, retention. So those are. I think I mentioned that already. So again, we take our staff to the local facilities. So we're in churches, we're in 
um, schools and cafeterias, everything has to be mobile. We go to them to collect that. And then what, what I'll just tell you, just a snippet, we're, we're in the process of finalizing our baseline six-month data. Some of the, what you'll see here is that we see some hopes that there are some changes happening, particularly with our primary outcome and BMI. We do see a change from baseline to follow-up that seems to be statistically significant in both groups, so group one and group two. So this is the question of we don't have the other control group to see whether or not, um, we don't have the control group to see if that's different than anything, but it doesn't at least seem like there's a whole lot of difference between having the group-based program or the group-based program plus the intervention. We're getting some things that are reasonably well in both. So that's our primary thing. And then we also, it looks like there may be some other things, at least clinically, blood pressure, and perhaps even total cholesterol and triglyceride that may also be moving in the right direction. So our primary challenges have been limited number of quality applications of community strategies. So I mentioned we fund and we get funding, but what we have been challenged is a lot of community-based organizations don't want that responsibility to have the money. We actually have one grantee that gave us the money back because of the reporting structure and they were really anxious about that. Um, so we're not, you know, we've been talking about that. We talk about capacity building. We talk about empowerment. We talk about equal partnership, but it's very intimidating to have a university be your partner, especially someone as large as UAB. And so that's part of what we're doing. The co-occurring health issues that I mentioned before um, were also problematic. We had a lot of discussions, heated discussions among our investigators, where folks are saying, "Those are the people we want to intervene with. Why are we not intervening?" And so we had to make the separation between: Are we doing a service project? Um, and healthcare project, are we doing a research project? And so we still have those ongoing debates about whether or not we get the right thing. The last few things, you know, just to keep in mind with PDPR, so there's the total, on the left side, there's the expert-driven research. It's the more traditional way of things. And on the right side, it's totally some community-driven. I consider myself more to the right, but in all honesty, I'm not totally to the right, and most of us cannot be. There is a program announcement that we're applying, you know, that we're answering to. There's some things that are really dictated where it can't totally be there. We can have a lot of influence. We can make sure we're having these relationships and we can be closer to the right. Um, but if we're honest, it's very, very difficult to be totally community driven in terms of what our infrastructure is like. Um, maintaining competent and enthusiastic staff is really, um, can be challenging. Um, so my field staff, live in rural Alabama, live in rural Mississippi. I'm in Birmingham, um, and my project manager is in Birmingham. We try to get out, but a lot of this is relying on them to do things on their own, and, and not everybody is equipped to be left alone. Um, training and supervision becomes challenging. Accountability, again, when you have home offices. Um, human subjects and IRB has been challenging to make sure that those individuals can go through that horrible you know, tra initial training. Sometimes we have to sit literally with them to help them, you know, make sure they understand because those training programs are not necessarily geared for the populations and the staff that we have. But they are out there UAB employees, so they've got to have that training. Um, maintaining funding beyond the RCT. So as I, I said, 2015, August 31st, this project is over. We got some money probably for at least six months or to a year for carry forward. NCI has not reissued that program announcement, so we're scrambling trying to figure out what do we do. What do we do with a 15-year partnership? Um, and so some of it has been people like myself and others who are still using that infrastructure, but that's a big burden given you saw that huge um, infrastructure. What do we do? And then translating those findings for community members. We try, we try, we try, um, but p-values don't work. Odds ratios don't work. They want to know you know, why did my grandma die, you know, three weeks after she was diagnosed with breast cancer? Um, that's what they want to do. And population health, change in the population health takes a long, long time. Um, and the cost, it, it, these center grants are multiple millions of dollars. Um, and so that's not something that's likely in the current funding climate to continue to be um, at, available to us. So they are very expensive. Um, CDPR is a marathon rather than a sprint. I tell people all the time, if you're not in it for the long haul, don't, don't even try because it becomes, um, a, you know, you really get defeated. And then all participants, researchers, and community members, again, the co-learning, jointly responsible for the success. So make sure that, that that's happening. 
Um, the mutual trust and respect is essential. Part of what I do when I talk with part, part, start working with partners, first thing I do is I put the money on the table. So here's the budget. This is what you get. This is what I get. Keep in mind that a $1 million grant, 50, what, 4% of that is going to UAB for infrastructure. It's not even going to the direct cost. So we have those conversations so it's not a mystery as to what's happening because all the time, and I get on our PR people all the time, they want to blast the UAB gets $50 million to do blah, blah, blah. With the community thinking, that's $50 million. Why aren't you spending on me? And it was like, well, I only get 24 of that 50 million, you know, whatever. It becomes very difficult to explain. So making sure that that's there. Be true to the CDPR model. Um, it requires significant resources. So again, if you can't be true to that, then it's something different. It can be community-engaged research, community participation in research, but CDPR has a specific definition and you want to just make sure that you're being clear about that. Um, and need to evaluate the cost-benefit ratio for ongoing and future programs. We have not done that in the Deep South Network. I know there are other projects that have done that. That's really important. It's going to be helpful for later on to make sure that these programs can stay around. I think it's part of the deliberations that NCI is having right now. What is our return on investment? Um, and so I think that's really critical going forward. So, that's all I have formally to say. I'm happy if there are other questions or thoughts, comments. Yes. Yeah. It's a good question about yeah. uh, the study, just to start of interest. Um, group 2 was your intervention group. Yeah. And you obviously noticed that that group is better educated, much higher income. And I would imagine that's statistically significant looking at the numbers. Um, is that a function of the different communities? Uh, and also, how are you kind of thinking about how am I going to yeah. encounter, so, kind of account for these things? So we have, we have one, a big, one of those big yeah. boxes on the left is our biostatistics group. So we, we it's, a, it's a cluster randomized design. Mm -hmm. So theoretically, um, that should be balanced out, but we are accounting for, for the interclass correlations between different communities. Mm -hmm. The other thing socially is that, um, and one thing I've grown to appreciate as I've been involved with the DCAP network over the last 10 years, that a person with a bachelor's degree or even a master's degree um, in one area um, doesn't necessarily equate to the same degree and it also doesn't necessarily equate to a change in income. So these communities are such where people have advanced degrees as one measure of socioeconomic status, but their incomes really don't match. I mean, there's a big amount of disparity in terms of how they get paid um, versus others. So those are things that we're digging down deeper in there, but we, we are looking at some of these clustering effects. We are trying to account for some of the other differences between groups and, and look at that. And so that's been part of the complexities and why our six-month paper has been delayed because we're trying to figure out and account for all of those things. And that's also one of the challenges when you're doing these multi-level interventions. How do you do it? We can't randomize on the individual level, particularly in small rural community. Everybody knows everybody. So you get so much contamination. So the best way we could do is randomize by county. And we try to, at any given time, not have counties that are connected to be in the same uh, wave of, of um, two years at the same time. But those are um, good questions that we're hoping to tease apart. So, yeah. 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 We hear an awful lot these days about team science and talking about, you know, most people are thinking about in terms of access to that cyclotron in some other <laughs> stage, yeah. but, but you have a huge research team. Yes, we do. do you feel like you have the right support to optimize your team? And is that, I mean, yeah. I would guess that that's a major part of your daily life. It, so it is, and, and I personally value the team science, and I've got about four or five NIH grants with PI right now, and all of them include team science. So um, so we've got folks like, so while Dr. Parker is not directly on the grant, he's sort of, you know, oversight and has that. We have nurse, you know, um, nurse scientists that are involved, physician assistants, behavioral science, epidemiology, um, weight management. We've got people from different realms, and that to me makes much which for much more of a richer design and developing and also interpreting. So each person um, sort of also for our dissemination, they see different things there. So we've got a wealth of dietary data. And so we've got an investigator who's a nutrition scientist, for example, and she's running with all of that data. 
I wouldn't have a clue where to, to look at the micronutrient versus the macronutrient and what to do with that. Um, but, it, but it helps with these complex problems, like what we're seeing here, addressing weight and weight management, that's not easy to do. We all know better. Um, so people always say, oh, education, education. Well, I think we know a lot. We just can't get it done for a variety of reasons. And having that group has been helpful. I also have seen, um, we have a, another larger project with OBGYN. So I've got, you know, um, you know, MDs on that side and so forth. But it, it, to me, it's very helpful to sort of think about the design, think about things that we weren't considering, um, to come up with the, so hopefully the solutions to these complex problems. And again, putting on my reviewer hat, those kind of applications that come in do far better when looking at that team because some, you get that, that, that sort of that siloed kind of mentality and we get the same results and so we, we can't do that anymore. And I genuinely felt supported from everybody. We, but it starts with trust. I mean, we, we get in, we figure out the language, there's some translation that needs to happen to about what do you mean by this term, what do I mean? Um, but we have regular meetings, so with, with all the team we have probably, um, depending on where the project is, we may have a monthly meeting where all the investigators are together with the staff people. We also bring our community advisory, community folks together, and then I, I help train them and my staff help train the investigators. You can't use that word. You need to translate that, and even if they slip up and use one of those jargony words, you say, hey, you know, Dr. Sorenso, would you, you know, tell us what that means? And so, so yeah, it's, it's been very rewarding for me. Does the RFA specify the team, or yeah. it's really, so was this a career's worth of trial and error to get to being knowing how to put a good team together, or um, are there specific things you can give people advice about how to approach the team? Yeah, I, I think process? for me, it's been trial and error, knowing, and also the biggest thing is your own self-assessment, so knowing where your own, where your limitations are. You, no one can be anything, everything. So you can't be the biostatistician. So so while I have a general knowledge of what we're doing with the biostat piece, that's why I have a team member that knows that work and does that work well. But when she goes to write that that section of the paper, she's talking with me or the epidemiologist on the group say, hey, you know, what what numbers make sense here and so forth. So I think part of it is knowing where, you're, where you have your strengths and where your limitations are and feeling those limitations with individuals that have strengths in those areas. The other part of writing grant applications and having those teams that get evaluated, you don't want people to have exact same expertise. So you don't want five psychologists and everybody's doing behavioral uh, interventions for nutrition and physical activity. Because it's like, you know, you know, isn't one good enough or, or two? Um, but if you're not trained in, um, in assessment of um, psychosocial measures related to stress, then if you have an expert in that area, then that makes sense to bring that person on. Or if you've been in more of the psychosocial area, you've never done the biological measures, then bringing someone in for that area is important to do that. And it's all about your, your networking, figuring out who's doing the kinds of work that you're doing. For me, it was earlier on in my career, talking with my mentor, saying, hey, I'm thinking about an idea of so-and-so, and them saying, hey, we need to go talk to this person here. And that person does something similar, why don't you go talk with them? And they may or may not have been the, the person who ended up on the grant, but then they gave me more um, suggestions about, oh, well, this is the person who knows how to do that. So, so definitely, I think, think about the overall what your design is, where your limitations are, where the other expertise is, so that when your grants are being reviewed, people are saying, this is a team. So it's not just you as an individual. Um, you need definitely, as your leader, you need to have the requisite knowledge. But most times now, we're looking at the full team. So does the full team, is it complementary to one another? Is it multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary? So that you're not just getting the same group of folks looking at it the same way. So so for your grants, is it enough just to have those people on the team? Or in your grant application, are you explicit about, here's why these people on the team, and here's the collaboration plan, and here's how we plan to interact together? Over the course of the grant. Yeah, it should be pretty obvious what they are bringing to the table and where they play out in the grant itself. So as you're talking about your team and describing the expertise, describing your preliminary studies, you know, each one of those individuals should be somewhere in one of those preliminary studies to demonstrate their expertise. 
And then when they're doing their bio sketches and that, that early part of it where you're describing it, they should be very consistent about what they are uniquely contributing and it should match up with what's in the other part of the application. But I don't, um, I don't, and team science doesn't mean just having somebody on um, and paying a percentage effort here and there. I'm sure the folks even in my department would appreciate that in covering your effort. But for me, it's, you've got to do something. You've got to be in there and contributing. And that's where the, the benefit is of getting your expertise and knowledge because you're going to see something from a business standpoint that I'm not even thinking about um, because that's what you do more often than not. So. What was your strategy for developing these focus groups, like targeting the, the right people that would be representative and have contact with the community? Um, we cheat. So we find the people in the local and we say, who do we need to invite? Who do we need to bring? So we, we early on in the infrastructure, what they did to identify the community health advisors, they would just go into larger settings where community members were gathering and have people to say, hey, tell me the names or the, the name or the names of people that are the people that you go to when you have questions and the people that you would respect, respect in your community. And what happened is as certain names kept being repeated by several people, those are the people we start honing in to and then we start reaching out to them and say, hey, would you be willing or interested? You were nominated by X number of people. And the reason that sort of I talked about it being social networking before Facebook kind of a thing, it, that's what it really is about. It's about your social networks. Who are you connected to? Who values your opinion? Because that's what we want to tell the message. We want it to spread um, very widely. So that's what we start. And we rely heavily on the local folks to tell us what meetings do we go to, who are the right partners, who are the wrong partners. And when we get stuck on things, we're like, oh, we really love that meeting. How can we get out of it? No. And just um, kind of related, um, in every community there will be people who are kind of disengaged from that community. Do you go make any efforts to somehow include them? We do. So part of, so the the current CTOF network is divided into the research project, which is what I have, and then just ongoing outreach. So for the 12 plus counties that were not part of the research project, they are focusing on outreach to counties and well, zip codes that we have never been able to infiltrate in the past. So even with the networking, you know, if you're going around the same people, you may not be going into those pockets. So they specifically do the GIS mapping and where the SEER data and looking at where cancer cases are, they're putting people specifically in those areas, going into um, the Dollar Generals, the other places where people are just there and trying to do random intercepts with them to get folks that, that we're not necessarily reaching um, going forward. So so it, it's you know using technology, using all the resources available to us, both in the folks that we know and the folks that we know we're missing, trying to target interventions that way. Thank you guys. <laughs>